Um, and then I'm very pleased to introduce Eliza Halbiger. Um, she, Eliza, um, we were scheduled for a year ago, you remember, and things changed. And I'm just so glad to have her here now. Uh, there were a lot of comments at the time about really wanting to hear this topic. So I'm glad that, that she's able to do it. Um, Eliza joined the San Juan County Conservation Land Bank in 2003. Her current responsibilities as land steward include ecological assessment, monitoring and restoration on land bank reserves and managing, and I think this takes most of her time now, the Salish Seeds Project native plant nursery that many of us have benefited from in our gardens and when we walk on Turtleback and other places. Um, and that's a joint project with the land bank and, San, and the Preservation Trust. And she lives with her husband and son on San Juan Island, and she managed the ferries and is here with us today. So that's another thing to be grateful for. Um, and with that, uh, Eliza, thank you for joining us. Thanks, Cindy. Okay, good morning. Um, thank you for your interest today. Let me get my stuff here. I'm gonna talk about creative rewilding with native plants in the San Juan Islands. I'm very place-based information today. Well, it was working early. There we go. What is rewilding? The term was originally coined to refer to quite large scale restoration, having to do with restoring big natural processes. A good example from our region would be the removal of the Elwha Dam which brought uh, all sorts of functioning back to a very altered river system. Uh, so this type of rewilding is incredible. Uh, it's not what we're gonna be talking about today, but this really was the original meaning of the term. So I like to clarify that we're not, we're not tackling the Elwha Dam here today, um, but I'm going to talk about the other way I see the term used a lot these days, which has more to do with modest activities that almost anyone can take. It involves putting native plants back into the landscape and reducing human impacts, making more space for wildlife. This type of rewilding could happen on a small farm or a nature preserve. It could happen on your deck. It could happen um, in a parking strip in East Sound, as it has here in Friday Harbor, um, a little grassy area at the Family Resource Center, uh, where my friend Jenny Harris created this beautiful garden from a lawn, which is now teeming with native plants and critters. This is the type of rewilding that we're going to take a look at today. It's all about looking for opportunities, however small, to make the places where we live a little more diverse and wild. Uh, no, we're not ready for that, sorry. So sometimes people talk about rewilding as meaning you just let nature take over without any human interference. And I'm not taking quite that position today, um, believing that humans do live in nature and we can't remove ourselves from it. Um, and that our actions can sometimes have a beneficial impact. But certainly striving to have a lighter touch is integral to rewilding. So my talk is intended to be practical. We're gonna go through some generalizations and then get down to specific examples of how to do small scale rewilding here in the San Juan Islands. I'll use examples ranging from backyard gardening and landscaping to techniques you might use in more natural areas. So uh, let's take a closer look at why you might want to do this. Okay, there's my photo. Um, do we really need more native plants in the San Juans? A lot of people would say that they're doing just great in the islands. The landscape is beautiful. People flock here to see it. We have madrona trees, salal and wild rose and forests. But while some plants are thriving, many are not in good shape at all. In particular, the plants indigenous to Gary Oak savannas, native grasslands, coastal bluffs, 
and similar uh, open to partly open habitats, those areas are in trouble. It's estimated that about 95% of these habitats are gone from our region. They've been replaced by non-native agricultural grasslands and residential development, invasive plants, too many deer, the lack of fire have all contributed to their decline and to a reduction in biodiversity. Native plants support healthy ecosystems and they do so local ecosystems and they do so far better than introduced plants. Our island wildlife evolved to use these species. They're at the base of local food webs. And when we lose the plants, we lose the creatures that use them for food and habitat. Often we don't even know what's missing because we've never seen it before. For example, okay, that was the gloomy part, but um, let's consider Gary Oak for a moment. In our region, the seemingly tough and unpalatable leaves of Gary Oak provide food for no less than 201 species of moths and butterflies. This is data from the National Wildlife Federation, which has some very interesting numbers on particularly caterpillar larvae and what they're eating in particular regions. Uh, so no wonder birds spend so much time foraging in Gary Oaks when they're feeding their young, they're eating all those caterpillars. Gary Oak acorns are food for band-tailed pigeons locally and for squirrels at least on orcas. We don't have squirrels on San Juan, which is of great interest always, yeah. Um, and the natural cavities in the oaks are prime nesting spots. Or take Douglas Aster, which blooms in late summer. It's still blooming now uh, when wild flowers are scarce. It attracts large numbers of pollinating insects like bumblebees, leaf cutter bees, a uh, skipper butterfly is shown here. And during the fall and winter months, the seeds of Douglas Aster will feed birds and other small animals. I'm going to talk briefly about the Salish Seeds Project, a partnership between the San Juan County Conservation Land Bank and the San Juan Preservation Trust. It was started in 2015 to try to counteract the loss of these and many other native plants in the islands. The main goal of the project is to provide plants and seeds for habitat restoration. To meet this need, we started a small nursery at Red Mill Farm on San Juan Island. Funding from grants and private donations has allowed us to gradually build a third of an acre facility with deer fencing, irrigation, electricity, and, and most recently, a work shed. We produce about 20 pounds of native seed annually. We grow tens of thousands of these small plugs for mostly for habitat restoration. And we grow some potted plants for sale to the general public. So my talk today, and we grow some bulbs as well. My talk today is going to emphasize rewilding with the wildflowers and grasses of Gary Oak and grassland habitats, but I'm gonna throw in some other things as well. Uh, but I like to focus on these plants. It's where I have the most experience, um, but also they used to be common. Uh, maybe they'll be common again, who knows? Um, many of these plants were important, were and are, important cultural plants for Coast Salish people. It's because of Coast Salish stewardship of the landscape that they grew here in such abundance. The sweet energy rich bulbs of Camas were once a staple for indigenous people throughout the Pacific Northwest. People used fire and other techniques to promote the growth of Camas and many, many other useful plants that grew alongside it. The result was large areas of very diverse grass and wildflower dominated habitat, the very habitats that today are so diminished. We'll come back to Camas later in the talk. These are not from a textbook. I sort of, these popped into my head as sort of organizing principles for when you are doing rewilding, be opportunistic, look for places, um, that 
where you could easily tuck a few new plants. Um, and I'm thinking of new construction that's caused some ground disturbance, a new drain field, a neglected corner of your yard where nothing much seems to grow very well. Be messy, whoops, no, no, we're still there. Be messy, um, don't clean up too much because the plant materials, the seeds, the stems, the leaves, that's what insects and animals are using to live in and to eat. And so I know it's tempting to clean everything up in fall and winter and you can do, don't, you know, if something's driving you crazy, cut it back, but leave something for the wildlife. Uh, and I'll extend that to the soil where our insects, you know, we think of them only in the summer when we see all these insects, but, you know, they're with us all year in some form, whether it's an egg, you know, a caterpillar, a larva, often they're in the ground or on the plant. So they're there just because we cannot see them. It doesn't mean they're not using your the habitat you've created. Be observant. Uh, Laura was talking about this last night, how she's been watching in her garden and seeing which species of sunflower the bees visit and which ones they don't like. Uh, so really, you are the best person to guide your project from your own observations. And my last one was start small, which is perhaps the best information for almost anything, I think. Uh, maybe that's just how I do things. Um, types of plant materials, you can work with seeds. Um, seeds, are, some of this kind of depends on your preference. I love growing things from seed, but it's some people work much better with other types of materials. Seed can seem really easy. You buy some seed and spread it around, um, and it can work very well, but there's um, a lot of emphasis on really preparing your site very carefully before you put the seed out. So uh, to reduce competition from other plants and all the seeds that are already in the soil. Um, and we'll talk more about this later too. Um, what else? Containers, more expensive to buy, takes more time to plant, but more, um, guaranteed that your plant is alive <laughs> and likely to grow if you put it in the right spot. And you can also, with plants, then you have the option of using wood chips and mulches and materials to limit uh, competition from other plants if you choose to. Um, or you can plant a plant in a place where there's already lots of vegetation. You can you know, tuck things in. The establishment of the plant is faster. And then bulbs and bare root. Um, also, I mean, they're basically plants too. They just come without the soil. And this is a oh, just a nice low impact option because you don't have all these dumb plastic pots and um, you just have the plants and um, you plant them when they're dormant. And so this can be a really good technique as well. Okay, and one more background thing is deer, which I can't give a talk like this without having one slide about deer. Um, you probably all know that deer populations in the islands are extremely high, or they were, and I know they've gone down and they're coming up. And, and we all saw that one year, how incredible the bloom was that year that there weren't very many deer. I was amazed. I saw plants in places where I'd never seen them before, and they'd been there the whole time. They were just eaten. Um, anyway. They're damaging our native flora. If you visit a deer-free island or an island with fewer deer, you'll be surprised at how big and lush the vegetation is, sword fern, even ocean spray. The leaves are bigger because the plants have not been um, eaten for, for decades. Um, and you see things you don't see much, like Columbia lily, uh, which you'll find on Patos, where there are few deer. And maybe in the uh, thicket of roses, you'll sometimes see it poking up above the roses because the deer can't get in there. When we started uh, years ago collecting seed in the wild for the Salish Seeds Project, uh, we discovered that a lot of the plants whose seed we wanted 
they never set seed because the green seed pods were favored by deer as a very nutritious thing to bite. You know, the plants putting all these resources into the green seed um, for the next generation and the deer come along right before it ripens and eat that. So uh, we realized that a lot of these plants aren't really reproducing very much. So we put out cages so that we could get a little seed. Anyway, the deer are having an impact. So if you, you can do rewilding in the open where there are deer, it just limits what you can grow. Although, you know, there are some creative tricks you can use. Um, you know, you can put some sticks over your plant. I mean, really just like throw a bit of debris over your precious plants to make it a little harder for the deer to get there. Uh, I mean, I've seen people do really interesting things to just, you know, make a few barriers, but you will be limited. Um, and um, so I'll try to note today which plants have some deer resistance. And then, of, of course, if you're in a deer free zone, like a fence garden, you have um, a lot more flexibility in what you can grow. Okay, if you've ever heard me speak before, and I know some of you have, You've heard me gush about sea blush. Um, this is a wonderful place to start, I think, for almost anyone uh, with enough sun to grow it. It's um, sea blush is an annual. It blooms in the early spring and then it dies. But if there's any bare ground available, it will reseed itself. You can grow sea blush fairly easily from seed by sowing it now through early November. Uh, at which time it will germinate in a couple of weeks this time of year, and then it will overwinter as a small plant and bloom in the early spring, April, May. Or you can sow it in March and it will bloom that same year. It'll just be a little smaller. Um, and it's a wonderful plant for bumblebees and other spring pollinators. It has a nice smell. Um, it likes sun, but it also does fine in part shade like this Gary Oak and Douglas fir woodland where there are big gaps in the canopy. So shade, but you know, spotty. Um, and it is deer resistant, at least I know in years past, I feel like orcas had more deer than San Juan. So I, a lot of my experience is from San Juan, but even on orcas, I used to see sea blush and it would get browsed so it would be smaller but um, it wasn't destroyed, it would still bloom. So you can grow it even with deer. What I like about sea blush is it's so adaptable. You can grow it in a pot on your deck. Um, I like this photo because then I can be on my soapbox for just a minute and encourage everyone to hang up your laundry in the summer. It's the <laughs> best use of the sun, no batteries, no, Solar panels, it just does its work for you. Um, and then you get to be with your sea blush. Um, you can, that's sort of blurry. I guess it's a blurry photo. Sea blush does very well in thin, rocky, and well-drained soils. Makes it a great choice for paving stones set in sand or in a kind of rock garden. Uh, and again, it will self-sow if there's bare ground available. And I. I, this slide is actually a little deceptive. These are my front steps and I just put in these pavers. Um, the sea blush only lasted here for two years because the soil underneath here is actually really deep, moist, um, productive soil. So what happened over time is, you know, grass, big tough grasses and other things sort of moved in. But if you had a truly drier site underneath, um, it will persist. It's just if things are too lush, there's no bare ground for the seed to grow in. So eventually it'll die out. But you know what? I enjoyed it for two years and I've still got it lots of other places. So, and oh, uh, later today, I'm gonna drop some seed blush off at the seed library. So anyone who wants to borrow seed, grow it, save seed and return it, you can try that. Um, see how that works. Oh, wait, there's more. Okay. Um, this is in a vegetable garden. Um, I thought I'd try it with my garlic, which you sow, you plant your bulbs in the fall, right? And I thought, oh, well, plant sea blush too. And neither of them needs water because they get the 
you know, water through the winter and spring, and then you kind of let the garlic dry out. So that was fun because it, um, you know, brought some life to the garlic patch. And then the other one, that's a black currant bush leafing out where you can see it's um, covered with wood chips. And it turns out, although a lot of things don't, a lot of seed doesn't grow very well in wood chips. And then these are like a year or two old, they're not fresh, but it turns out that, um, the seed blush really did fine there and it's self-sewed in the wood chips and established this nice dense stand and it kind of moves throughout. In fact, there's too much and I have to weed it out around the um, the current bushes and it's it's actually out of, seed blush is getting out of control in my garden. So um, that's really great, I think. Okay, let's talk about camas again. And I'm on sort of a seed theme here, starting with seed blush, seed blush, which is your entry plant to direct sowing. Um, and um, now we're gonna move on to camas, which is a little harder. It takes some patience to grow camas from seed, but for those of you interested in a small challenge, it's definitely worthwhile. Um, and you can also purchase bulbs of camas if you want quicker gratification. There's nothing wrong with that. Um, I'll just point to point out too before we talk about how to grow it. Uh, there's a, a seed seller on Whitby Island called Northwest Meadowscapes. Uh, I did highly recommend them. They have a good blog on their website called The Camas Lands, and it has information about growing camas in the Pacific Northwest. So that's a really nice reference as well and, and fairly inspirational. Um, to grow camas from seed, you want to start with a nice bare ground because pretty much all seed needs bare ground, right? It, the roots need somewhere to go. Um, the plant needs space. If it's already taken up with other plants, most of the seed is not going to grow. So if you're you know, buying native seed, which is not cheap, uh, give it the best start you can. So you could sow it in your garden. Camas is not super picky about soil, um, as long as it's well-drained, I wouldn't put it in heavy clay. You have to sow it in the fall. Camas seed needs to be cold and wet for at least two months. That's what triggers the seed to germinate. If you sow it in the spring, it's, it won't grow because it hasn't gotten that message that like, okay, I've been through the winter, now it's time to grow. Um, and then the first year, this is what cameras looks like. It's about that tall. It looks like a little blade of grass. Um, and that's all it's going to do. And then as soon as it dries up, as soon as this droughty sort of weather arrives in maybe May or June and we get some heat, it shrivels to the ground and don't be disappointed. It did its thing. It actually made a tiny little bulb in there, a bulb that can survive the summer drought. Um, you can do this. You can sow it in um, native soil, in potting soil, in a pot. I would say a fairly a deep pot is good, not a little teeny tiny thing. Um, anyway, so it sits out there and then the next Let's see, back up a step. This is, it germinates in like February. It's really early and hardy and then grows a bit and then goes dormant. The next year, it comes up again, February or maybe March, and it has two little, two little leaves, little grass blades. Then the third year is when it really starts to look like camas. You might get a bloom your third year if you've given it like this beautiful sight and, you know, kind of kept the weeds out. It might take longer too if it's just sort of you know off in the corner of the yard. But um, once camas has developed a bit of a larger bulb, it's very resilient, and um, you know it, it it likes sun, sun to part shade. But that bulb um, is um, it's like the plant has it made. It spends these first few years just eking along and growing the bulb a little bigger, and then it's like it's set. And um, once you have an established plant, you know, the clumps um, should slowly expand and it will also start dropping seed. 
Um, and again, another wood chip plant. This happened at the Salish Seeds Project Nursery where we had camas in a bed and these old wood chips in the paths. Camas started taking over the paths because we let the seed drop and I actually can't really get it out of there because <laughs> the bulbs are going kind of deep and there's hundreds of plants. So we just let it take over there, which is, I think, maybe a sign, maybe that's a definition of what rewilding is, is when the things we're trying to grow sort of take off on their own and do their own thing. Um, Oh no, we're not ready for that. There was more camas. Yeah, I wanna talk about, okay, so where would you grow camas at home? Um, you can grow it in a pot, a nice bulb, you know, in a pot and um, it will flower there happily. If you have a lawn or a field where the grasses aren't too lush and robust, I wouldn't recommend this for, you know, really dense growth, but for more sort of a scrappy lawn area, you can plant camas bulbs directly into it. Uh, because again, that plant, I mean, that's a full grown plant there. It's got food and water and nutrients and it doesn't have an extensive root system. So, you know, put the bulb there and you can have camas. You just have to be sure you're not going to mow until June or early July, which will give the plants an opportunity to set seed. Um, you certainly don't want to bloom mow before they bloom or what's the point? Um, Camas works well in a garden setting with other perennials in the United Kingdom. It's been a popular ornamental bulb for a long time, uh, very popular over there. And they plant it in all sorts of areas. Um, I'm trying it out in a bed with uh, a rose bush and a fig, thinking that those shrubs, especially the fig, leaf out fairly late. Uh, yeah, I guess not roses, but the fig. And so that camas is going to get the early spring light, which it likes, and it's going to bloom. And then by the time it dies back and doesn't look like much, there will be roses and a beautiful fig tree. Um, so mixed perennial plantings. Keep in mind, and this is true for many of our native wildflowers, um, that in the summer, it's not gonna look like anything is there. It's sort of like daffodils, you know, they're beautiful in spring and then they shrivel to the ground. And so it's nice to actually have other plants there then that kind of fill in the space so you don't have a big empty spot. Um, and even lands that are grazed can support camas if the animals are managed so that they're not there eating the plant during its growth and bloom period. So with certain types of, um, careful rotational grazing, you can have camas and other natives. Okay, enough camas. Um, let's talk a little bit about seeding in more wild areas. Uh, this is Katy Mountain Preserve on San Juan Island, which has areas of uh, Gary Oak. So the um, smaller photo there is showing, there is a big oak tree there and there's also, um, a lot of Douglas firs that have been cut down that have moved in. In the absence of fire, our open grasslands and savannas have often become um, overtaken with Douglas firs in really dense stands. Like you see these super dense stands of trees that have shaded out the understory and resulted in this very low diversity, very fire, like scary fire prone. Uh, not, you know, a little grassland fire, but in all these trees um, areas. So what the land bank and, and, you know, many other conservation groups are doing is manually cutting down, removing the firs to save the oaks. Um, and we found when we uh, are careful with our timing, when we remove uh, firs and then get in there with seed, very quickly before other things have had a chance to get, you know, grow there and get established, we've had some good success at restoring uh, the understory of wildflowers and grasses. So to do this, again, the uh, fall is the time to seed for almost all our natives. It's best for most of them. Um, in an area like this where it was 
uh, partly forested, even though you know the trees had only been there maybe a couple decades, they dropped a lot of uh, needle litter. So we'll do a little bit of raking to get the, you know, reduce the buildup of needle litter to give the seeds, you know, closer contact with the soil. And so we broadcast seed. In many cases, we don't even cover it with anything because the with the fall rains, it gets sort of worked down into the soil. Um, so this is, um, yeah, a technique that, you know, it's different every year. Some years work better than others. Some areas work better than others, but it can be a very successful method. Okay, lots of people are interested in this. How do I turn my lawn into a wildflower meadow? And I will talk about this a bit today. Um, if you attend the meadow session of the Master Gardeners Fall Gardening Workshop, which is all online, right? All Zoomy webinar, I'm not sure what the, the format is. There's a whole, um, you know, two, back-to-back -back sessions devoted to this topic um, and particularly from someone who's done a lot of this. Um, so that'll be exciting, but I'll give you some ideas on this today as well. And um, this is another <laughs> deceptive photo from my own garden. Um, this again is a very deep soil, like lush kind of pasture that I um, covered with a tarp for a year or more and then seeded it. And it looked amazing for a couple of years. And then the pasture grasses, seeds, and, and the native grasses I planted too, they're still there. And there are still you know, some natives out there, but not the sea bush. Um, the grasses took over. So this was, what has done well out here is, um, some bigger, like more deep soil natives like goldenrod and aster um, and things that, you know, can actually compete with that grass. So I chose plants that look good for a while, but um, it really, other things wanted to grow there so badly that it would take a lot of work to keep it in this stage. So actually a thinner soil, drier soil site probably would have been a better choice for this. I'm getting ahead of myself though. Um, the challenge with converting a lawn to a wildflower meadow is you gotta get rid of the lawn. You gotta get rid of what's growing there. And there's different ways to do this. And I highly recommend trying a small patch before you decide you're turning your whole area into a meadow because you're gonna learn so much from that patch. Um, people put down tarps, um, people use herbicide. Uh, people will mulch with cardboard and wood chips, but then you probably want to actually remove that before you seed, because although I've given you two examples of things growing in wood chips, that's often the exception. Uh, soil is generally better. Um, you can strip the sod, actually remove the upper layer. That can be really effective. And if it's a deep soiled site, that actually takes away some of the soil, which you might not want for you know this type of a habitat um, again because deeper soiled areas other plants are really going to want to grow there badly um, let's see there was one other method oh well the other method is you bring in soil so you could do this in a garden bed where um, you know it's purchased soil compost sand mix that doesn't have a lot of seed in it already um, or other soil that you bring in. So there's getting rid of what's there, and then there's the seed that's already in the soil. And that, you know, if you, however much time you can spend on getting your site prepared, the better. So if you really want, and I recommend at minimum a year of smothering to kill the grass, or if you strip the sod, that would be quick. Um, or this, another way, if you know there's like a ton of seed in that soil that's weedy and competitive, one thing people do is they'll repeatedly hoe or till it. So they'll let stuff germinate and then you hoe that out of there, let it do it again, you know, hoe it out, or you could let it grow and cover it with plastic again. So it's 
that's sort of trying to exhaust the seed bank in the soil a bit. I've actually never done that. That's pretty, um, pretty committed, uh, but certainly feasible on a small scale. But I just mentioned that because um, it has a lot of potential. So let's look at a, a, oh, this is a good resource too from the Xerces Society, X-E-R-C-E-S. Um, they have a lot of good stuff about insects and pollinators. And this kind of repeats some of what I said, but it has other good tips as well. And you can just search for that and you'll find it. Also at the end of my talk, I will direct you to some other resources. These are photos from Driggs Park, which is what we call the lot in town where in Friday Harbor, where the land bank has its office. It's actually a public park. You can enjoy the picnic table in the yard there. It doesn't look much like a park, but, <laughs> but it is. Anyway, at the side of our office building, there's this really dry sort of miserable lawn. Um, so we decided we'd try to make a meadow there. And quickly what we did, we put down this ugly plastic tarp uh, two years ago. A year later, middle photo, we took off the tarp. We spread two inches of sand on top of it. And we wouldn't have had to do this, but this is a really interesting technique. Um, so sand, then we sprinkled the seed. The sand is a really nice substrate for seed to germinate in. And we rake the seed in. And um, sand, although we think of it as well-drained, it also kind of uh, holds moisture in the damp time of year because it, uh, it limits the evaporation. So it's actually sort of a mulch. I know that sounds weird, uh, but it can keep moisture in the soil. It's weed free. So at least for the top inches of uh, top two inches where we spread it, we knew there weren't other seeds there. And that if our seeds got going quickly, they'd probably get a head start on things that were deeper in the soil. And it also retains heat, which you might or might not want. This is a south facing side of the house, but there's also some shade, as you can see from shrubs and trees nearby. So we raked seed into the sand. We mixed the seed first with, um, I think it was diatomaceous earth. There's all sorts of things you can use to mix seed with to allow you to spread it more evenly. Because often you don't have much seed. It's really small and you're like, it's coming out in big clumps. And so if you mix it with uh, a larger quantity of some inert material and diatomaceous earth is white, so you can see exactly where you're spreading it. Um, and then it looked quite beautiful this spring. Um, but wait, there's more. And then oh, we also planted some plugs and some bulbs. So we kind of cheated. It wasn't just seed. Uh, and then this August, it looked terrible. <laughs> and everyone in my office was like, what have you done? It's like, no, they're alive. It's just this, we live somewhere where we have summer droughts. So um a lot of plants don't look like much unless, you know, you water them. And one, two of my goals here were not going to water it, not going to fence it from deer, and we're going to see how it does. Some things won't make it, but we'll see what does, because this is the situation most people have, deer and limited water. Um, anyway, it greened up again this month. Uh, things are coming back. It's going to keep evolving. But I think that middle... Photo. It's also a good illustration of what your first year with a seeding project might look like. You get these pretty annuals blooming in the spring. Oh, it's so nice. You know, and then they die. And the perennials aren't doing much yet. They're just focusing, just like camas, though not quite as extreme as camas. They're focusing the first year or two on growing roots and on photosynthesizing, making energy and storing it so that by the second or third year, they can bloom and grow big. So the first year, pretty scrappy looking. Um, however, I'm anticipating that next summer we're going to have, you know, those grasses will be bigger. Some of the other perennials will be bigger. So there'll be a little more form and structure to it. Uh, and I also want to add more rocks and wood. I should have talked about habitat features. It's not just the plants, 
but um, put some physical structure in your space because it creates all these little micro habitats for plants and insects to use. You know, just a bit of shade uh, from a chunk of wood can allow a plant to survive that wouldn't survive out, you know, in the parched sun area. There's a little more moisture there. Uh, or the south side of a rock might be perfect for the most heat loving thing that you're growing. Um, so, and you can kind of let the plants and insects work it out, you know, where they, uh, where they want to live. Anyway, if you're interested in that, sign up for the Master Gardeners Fall Gardening Workshop. <clears throat> um, where am I here? Hedgerows or shrub borders, we might call them. This is a guide I really like. There's this uh, fabulous native plant nursery, satin flower nurseries are on, um, in the Victoria area, which means we can't really buy plants or seeds from them because there's a lot of international border rules about moving plant materials and it's really complicated for them to sell stuff. Uh, but it's worth checking because there might be a way. Anyway, they put together this very nice guide uh, to planting hedgerows. And what I love about it is and there's sea blush, see in the corner? It's uh, perfect for, um, it's perfect for our region. It's from Southern Vancouver Island. So all of their plant recommendations for different soil types and different techniques are applicable to us here. Um, so hedgerows, and I'm gonna use the word hedgerow sort of loosely because I also include in hedgerow planting some of these tall native wildflowers. These are three I talk about a lot because I think they look really nice together and they bloom at the same time and um, and they can kind of hold their own uh, in a way that some of the smaller wildflowers get like pushed out by bigger bully plants in certain situations. So, um, a hedgerow can, or a shrubby border can include shrubs, and then maybe on the south side of it, you could plant some of these tall perennials. In addition to these, fireweed is a wonderful one. The deer will eat that, though. The goldenrod, somewhat deer resistant. Douglas aster, somewhat deer resistant, and probably everlasting is pretty good. I don't, I don't think they go for that. At least not that I've seen. Um, Yarrow, even you could use in a sort of shrubby area. So, um, and but actually, I want to talk more about goldenrod because I really love it. Um, but for planting hedgerows, um, again, you don't, unlike seeding, where you really want to, like, you know, spend a lot of time getting your site ready, you can plant. Um, shrubs into an area where there's already vegetation, you still probably, you might want to mulch around them, dig a nice deep hole and put out some wood chips to control the grass, but you don't have to, you know, like cover it with plastic for a year. You can tuck shrubs into an area that, um, you know, that isn't too thickly vegetated already. And yeah, I do recommend then, you know, mulching to give them the best chance of success, but um, I've done this with goldenrod too, planting it into a somewhat grassy area and putting out, you know, sort of tucking some cardboard around it and throwing some wood chips down, kind of sloppy, like, oh, I want to do this right now and I haven't thought about it ahead of time, but let's just plant it and then put out some mulch. And it, uh, it the, a couple sites at least, it did very, very well with that. And it is one plant that seems to keep out, you know, the big tough grasses that, um, are often a challenge for growing natives in the sun. Like the grasses seem to really be tough. Well, they've been bred to be tough, right? To withstand livestock grazing and all sorts of things. So um, anyway, goldenrod, fabulous plant. It supports a lot of insects. It blooms late at a time when the insects need some flowers. Um, and it's just, isn't it, isn't it pretty? A couple other, you can plant all kinds of things in a hedgerow, but these are two I really like. Snowberry, everyone knows it's common, but it's pretty, right? <laughs> and the deer don't, you know, they don't eat it too much. So um, 
if at all. I don't know, do they eat it? Maybe a little. Another one I love is post black gooseberry, Rives the varicatum. It's really thorny, so the deer don't eat it. Um, and it has these very early blooming flowers that tons of insects use. Not so much, you know, the big bumblebees that we all love, but you know, little flies and you know, I don't know what, little waspy things and all sorts of creatures use it. And then it makes fruit that's good for the birds. So um, really, and it's a very adaptable plant as well. Okay, we've all seen this, right? Oh, I don't know. Um, I see a lot of new construction in Friday Harbor and often they're, oh, you know, they bring in soil and it's like, oh, all this effort and guys heaving soil around and breaking it out. And then they plant that. <laughs> And it makes me so sad. Um, I don't know. Anyway, I think we can do better because there's um, there's some really great plants, native plants that you could grow. There's nodding onion, uh, somewhat deer resistant. I think it depends on the situation. Um, really pretty easy to grow, perennial. Gumweed, this is often a coastal plant here in the San Juans, but it'll grow in a lot of sites. It it does well in pretty dry, tough areas. Think of it growing on a rocky shoreline. It does this by having a very developed root system that goes deep and is thick and you know, storing water and nutrients to get the plant through the dry season. And it'll bloom in the middle of uh, summer drought. Um, great pollinator plant. Blue-eyed grass. This one likes a little more moisture, so it's not for every site, but it stays green for much of the year. Um, it's in the iris family. Deer don't eat it like much of the iris family plants, and they don't enjoy those. Yarrow. I mean, yarrow's common, but come on, it's nice. Um, Self-heal. Prunella vulgaris, another sort of common plant, but it can be really pretty in a mass planting. So um, at the Salish Seeds uh, Project Nursery, we built a shed a couple of years ago. It's sort of tucked into a hillside, doesn't show up too well here, but we had to do a lot of excavation to nestle it down in, and suddenly we had a lot of bare ground, so what that here's one of those opportunities, you know, we better plant it um, with natives, of course, because that's what we're growing there. So this is actually a pretty nice example of a very small, uh, you know, post-construction landscaping. We didn't bring in any soil. We didn't have too many weeds to contend with because the upper la layer of soil had been removed, and that's where most of the seed bank is, you know, seed has fallen, it's in the upper level. So that was taken away. We planted plugs, we sowed seed lush and a few other annuals. Um, the tall grasses you see there at the back of the left-hand photo is Romer's fescue, which is um, a very adaptable native grass. I love it. It forms a clump, so it makes room for other things. It doesn't, you know, spread out and take up all the space. And, um, you know, it has, it's, it's just pretty and it, it provides structure and space when your flowers have stopped blooming. You still have this nice clump of grass with some tall seed heads. On the shady north side, western columbine, it's doing well there. Um, did I want to say anything else about that? And I think that's that's it for that landscaping. Okay, this is sort of, this is like the luxury project. Um, this is the rooftop or shed, which is, and the reason I say it is, it's sort of like icing on the cake, um, kind of an extravagance, but also I really, I love green roofs. Um, so it was actually pretty easy to establish stuff here because all the soil was brought in. It, it was soil, it's pumice and sand and compost. And we threw in some biochar and um, a few other things. So beautiful blank slate. And we chose 
kind of the most drought resistant natives we could think of, did seeding, did plugging, did bulbs. The camas is doing very well up there and other bulbs uh, because they get the spring moisture. And then when this dries out and gets hot, they're dormant, so they don't care. A lot of natives see them. We tried some beech species, that's beech pea, the big green thing, and that has done really well, seashore lupin. Um, if anyone is interested in green roofs, I have a little write-up of this that explains exactly what we did, what the soil substrate is, and the techniques we used, um, should anyone be interested in, in that. And then I'm gonna stop with something a little less showy, but very accessible. Um, this is our lawn at home, which is really kind of this wet, funny area that we mow because we want it open. And a couple of years ago, we stopped mowing part of it um, to see what would happen. And it didn't turn into a stunning wildflower meadow, although there are a few natives in there. Um, we planted some camas bulbs just right into it and they've done okay. Uh, it's kind of a thick, grassy area. So I think um, it's not their perfect home, but you know, they keep coming back and blooming. But what was so great about this is watching um, how wildlife is using this area that we just stopped mowing. And uh, this is where the birds forage. If you see birds, that's where they are. If you go out this time of year and hear crickets, I don't hear them anywhere except in that little patch. And so those are just two signs that like, there's a lot of life happening in there just because we stopped mowing. And it's not without maintenance. Um, what this would really like to be if we just stepped back, we're like, we're not gonna intervene is this would be an alder forest. Um, <laughs> we get lots of alder seedlings in there. And we've been like, pulling them out and digging them out. So there is some work involved in our particular situation and everyone's situation is different. You might have, you know, your own weed or, um, I actually love alder trees. It's just, we don't want them right there. Um, so this can be a fun thing to do. I'm gonna wrap this up with a few ideas for what, how to learn more, because I've just kind of scratched the surface of a few different types of rewilding projects. So this is on the Land Bank's website, there's a Salish Seeds Project area. I wanna highlight that native plant resources for San Juan County. If you visit that, I put together a list of a variety of nurseries, some different guides, some of which I highlighted today. Uh, sources of information for learning more and also getting plants because um, that can be really hard to find what you want. Um, the Salish Seeds Project, we do sell some seed. It's kind of a odd collection and they typically, unless it's for a special event, they don't come in pretty packets. It's like you buy them in bulk, like I want, you know, 20 grams and okay, I'll package it up. So it's not super friendly for for the you know sort of home grower. They're, it's more intended for restorationists, but it's there. We'll sell seed to anyone, um, and you can also special order plugs if you have a larger project where you want to grow a larger number of plants. These are nice because they're they're more economical than big pots. You know, a tray this size has ninety eight plants. Uh, with a special tool that punches a hole in the ground. They're very easy to plant. You pop them out of their tube and put them in the ground. So we can take uh, special orders for those. You have to order pretty far ahead because we grow to order, basically. Um, and as I said, the Native Plant Resources has other, directs you to some other great nurseries and uh, places that you can find these plants. Um, if you want to volunteer at the Salish Seeds Project, I know you all live on Orcas, but one nice benefit of volunteering is that we always have a lot of volunteer plants that are in the wrong place. And 
we're pretty focused on production. We're like, okay, we're hoeing those out. We're, you know, we've got work to do. So when we have volunteers there the last, you know, 15 minutes, people go around and salvage things that we don't have time to salvage and you take them home with you. So that's kind of a nice little benefit, though you never know what, what the plan of the day will be. Um, and if you're interested in keeping up to speed with the Salish Seeds Project, I have a legal pad. We have a email list. It's mostly volunteer day announcements and it's not intended to like, you know, pressure you into volunteering because we also announce plant sales Occasionally we've had free things to give away. Um, that doesn't happen too often. And it's hard to get them if you're on Orcas because people go crazy for free plants. <laughs> They're like, ah! Um, so uh, anyway, if you're interested in keeping in touch with us about what we're doing, just put your name and email on this. I'm scared of the mm -hmm. speaker. And I will take questions. How about that? Yes. We have a disturbed area that is definitely new construction. And the, disturbed, the disturbed area, what comes growing back is the uh, thistle. Uh, and we want to take that area in small steps or whatever, but there's somewhere, depending on how you look at it, between 10 and 20,000 square feet of space to do something with. It's a three acre site, the rest is forested, and nothing's been done there. In any case, uh, about the thistle, especially, or anything else, but especially the thistle, uh, do you, what do you do with it first? Or is, will it, can you plant something that'll make it go away or? What, what kind what, of thistle? Well, I'm not sure it's the most common one and I don't know, remember or don't know which name, but I did look up and in some cases it was like called Scotch thistle, but it's not Scotch broom. Uh, it's one of the thistle ones that grows up and then gets a big pink flower that looks like a looks like an artichoke. And so it might be bull thistle, which is um, if it's Canada thistle, that one's a lot harder because that has these creeping rhizomes that spread and spread, and you can pull it and it'll keep coming back. Bull thistle has a tap root. So it's easier to pull, but your site is way bigger than that. It's, so I'm pretty sure it's the bull thistle. Yeah, I've okay. Heard that phrase used. And really it's prickly. Root, very prickly. Yeah. And it's a root Double glove. Great down. Yep. So you have bull thistle. So, you know, bull thistle is funny. If the area is going to be forested or shady again in the future, the bull thistle. I mean, I'm not saying it'll just go away over time because it's still there right now, but it, I mean, it loves those sunny areas. Um, I mean, that's a big area. Well, the, you bull, can, the bull thistle is probably on three or four thousand, two thousand square feet, totally in the sun, lots of sun. Yeah. Kind of, the forest starts and it doesn't grow there very much, but the part that's most visible, most would like to deal with is like a bed of it yeah well unfortunately this often happens it seems like you know the thistle gets going before in that space between the disturbance and when things you know if you could plant things immediately that could help but it's already at the thistle stage so you could cover it with something to smother it i mean is it already set seed i talked to jason at the noxious weed board because it seems like your first priority is deal with your weed problem. Um, because it's true, you know, the weeds are going to compete with what you're trying to plant. Like I said, though, you can, I mean, if you're planting things, you can mulch around them quite heavily. And, you know, that can slow the establishment of more thistle. Bull thistle is a biennial, so it'll usually form a big kind of rosette of prickly leaves one year and then the next year it sends up the stalk and then it dies so it doesn't live forever but of course it drops seed so you're really just thinking about how do i stop it from making more thistle well i have been right or wrong i don't know i have been cutting it down, weed whacking it down before it gets to blossom. Yep, that's good. So do it over and over again before it gets to blossom. Uh, that's great. That's great, because that'll stop it from making seed, or at least limit it. 
Yeah. Yeah, sorry, I don't have a magic solution, but talk to Jason. Yeah, yellow shirt in the back. Throw like uh, anything in wood chips. Do you put the wood chips? Do you um, put the seeds on top of wood chips, or do you put the wood chips down or the seeds down yeah, first? Seed I'm trying problem. not to do that. It's kind of weird, but anyway, um, you put the seeds and then the wood chips, or can you just? scatter seeds on top of wood chips and they'll fall in the crevice. So I, I must have misspoken. Most seeds you don't want to sow into wood chips. There, are, I gave a couple examples of ones that have worked in like one to two year old rotted wood chips, the sea blush and the camas. And there are probably a few others, but in those cases, having the seed on top is definitely the way to go. And they weren't, in those cases too, it was seed that naturally fell there and probably worked its way in a little bit with rain, uh, but fairly exposed. So um, if you wanted to try that, I would say, yeah, use older wood chips, put the seed on top. You could cover it with a little, maybe light sprinkling of straw or something just to give the seed a bit of protection, but you wouldn't even necessarily have to do that. So um, yeah, sea blush and camas were the two I mentioned. And I haven't in general, sowing in wood chips is not the greatest, um, but it's worked for those. So who knows? Maybe there's others to be discovered. Yes, in turquoise. Are there any particular um, plants that would grow in rocky shale on a, on a rocky shale slope? It has a little bit of dirt, not much, mostly well, rock. What's growing there now? Um, that, um, well, some wild strawberries, some, um, of that horrible prickly might be raspberry or something would never produce this fruit, just, you know, has thorns all over it. Uh -huh. Um, trailing, trailing. Yes. You know, you catch your feet in it when you're trying to climb around in it. Um, that mostly, um, mostly Is it shady, uh, parts, part of it, sun, part of it, shady. Sea blush. <laughs> Yay. Okay. Thank you. And that trailing blackberry, um, some plants are female and make the wonderful little tiny blackberry fruits, and some plants are male. So you've got you've got some males. <laughs> but yeah, what else could you grow there? Um uh sedums, maybe lance leaf sedum or broadleaf sedum, perhaps. Because it it likes a very dry spot, but you'll see it in part shade. Um, you could try the nodding onion that I, uh, it would probably be small there, but there's a lot of, um, trying to think of how I can direct you to somewhere that has a nice list of drought tar. I could send you the green roof right up, frankly, cause that has some things that could do well in, in dry, but yeah, try to start with the sea blush. See how that works. Yeah. Yes. About the seeds for the sea blush at the seed library. Is that the Orvis library? Yes. They're not there yet, but they will be this afternoon. So at some point, they'll be in there. Okay, great. Yeah. Um, second question is. Right. So my first question was where is the seed library? And it's at the Orcas library. It is, yes. It will be there. Yes. Okay. Um, is uh, New York Aster the same as Douglas Aster? I can tell by the name it's not. But what was the first name? New York Aster. New York Aster. No, that's probably quite different. Yeah. There's Dark. um. Girls, I, yeah. A lot of these asters look really similar. Yeah, let's see. And uh, there's cultivars of some of them, and it can be hard to tell apart. They're actually all pretty nice for pollinators. I just like the local one because I figure like there's probably some local things that only want Douglas Aster. So, but yeah, if you have something similar, it's probably also a good choice. Okay. And then along the same lines, uh, what is your opinion of lavender? Because it hmm. so attracts the pollinators, thrives here, deer resistant, drought tolerant. I'm okay with lavender. It's, um, <laughs> I like the smell. But it's it's I not think, native. I think it attracts a more limited number. Of, it attracts showy big pollinators that we'd like to see. Yeah. You know what I mean? Um, those are the ones that often catch our attention. Like, ah, there's bumblebees. And bumblebees are great. Right. Um, yeah. So, no, it's, it's nothing 
but it's not a, it's not native to it's the not sand. native okay. and it is drought tolerant that's nice i mean people like it also because things don't eat it right. and on one hand that's really nice because it survives on the other hand one the beauty of some of these natives is if something eats them that's actually good if like insects are eating it because it's feeding insects and it's feeding you know the food web so lavender I would, if you like lavender, by all means, grow it. I just, um, we shouldn't overstate its habitat value. It's great for some pollinators. I don't, th it doesn't necessarily have some of these other values that native plants do have. Okay, thank yeah. you. Yeah, what would you recommend for like, um, I guess you would call it a bald? Um, so there's a little bit of duck fur in the grown up, a typical bald, mm -hmm. um, sort of gum weed uh, on the rocks, mm -hmm. but just covered with velvet grass. Uh, so what kinds of plants? And of course, there's no deer protection as well. Right. So velvet, the grasses are hard. The exotic grasses are, they're big bullies. Um, but you have, so, hmm. You could try some bulbs if it's deep enough. I mean, do you have a couple inches of soil in spots? Not even, just very bare. Uh, so I was going to suggest camas, but if there aren't like little crevices for a bulb to get into, um, that's challenging. I mean, I feel like the velvet grass is your first challenge because if that were gone, there's um, little prairie star, lithophragma, parviflora, is um, it can grow in very, very thin soil. It has these little tiny bulblets almost um, and little tiny roots and, a pretty, well, the deer would eat it though. <laughs> um, sea blush, if you had bare ground, would be a nice place to start. Um, I still think, again, if you had bare ground, camas seed, I really advocate trying a lot of places because even though it may seem to you that it's all rock, there might be, you know, a bulb can work its, as it grows, works it, work its way down if you're growing from seed. Um, the gumweed. Again, if you wanted to email me, um, and I have my contact information, that would be helpful. Um, I could send you that green roof right up again because we modeled that after Rocky Bulls, thinking that that was the closest equivalent to what we were trying to grow. Nodding, not nodding onion, hooker's onion, which is a little bulb that's very shallow. Um, yeah, send me an email, I'll send you that and that plant list might be a nice reference for you. But I would recommend if you're planting things, pull out a clump of velvet grass and put a plant in there because that grass has to find a little soil in which to grow. It's probably found the deep soil sites. Yeah. Any other questions? Yeah. Is there a, a I'll check your resources list, but is there a, what's the best place to, to get native trees started? I almost always recommend Fourth Corner Nursery, but the problem with them is you have to order like 50. Exactly. So, so for smaller quantities, um, there's I haven't used this nursery a lot, but I, I like the look of them, uh, Plantus Nativas, which is, I think they're still around. They're, um, they're on the mainland. Yeah. Bellingham, yeah. Has anyone here bought plants from them? Yeah. yeah, so that's a, they do a, a variety of stock and I think it's, uh, it's container. Um, a lot of, a lot of trees. Who does? Bullocks. Oh, thank you. Oh, yeah. Over in Deer Harbor. Okay. They have a lot of native trees. That's great. So, yeah, in a way, I mean, the bullocks are already doing it, but if you have other, you know, nurseries here, you know, encourage them. Maybe they can be the ones to buy the 50 bare root, right, whatever good. from fourth corner and pot them up and sell them. But it's hard because people, you know, the natives don't look so great often in the nursery, except at certain times a year. So except for people who really know what they want, I think nurseries often get stuck with the natives and people don't buy them. So if you want them, yeah, 
I thought maybe it'd be great for the garden club to buy 50 of something, like a co-op model, you know. No, it's great. I think there's a lot of, I mean, the master gardeners do that. Uh, go ahead, Kate. Yeah. yeah. Master gardeners have a sale, some of you may know about it already, um, that starts up in January. So we'll send out notice to everybody. We usually do to the garden club, and you can buy native plants. And we get bulk, so you can buy right. and share with friends and that sort of thing. And they're often bare root, so the winter time is probably a good time to get them in pots. Just to repeat that for our Zoom audience to hear, the master gardeners do a native plant sale that we can look forward to in January. And I do have one other question from our Zoom audience. Um, and not to put anybody on the spot with a microphone, but it is so that our digital audience can also participate in this Q&A session. Are colchium part of the camas bulb family and are they treated the same way as a question from Lynn? Colchicum? Colchicum. So the autumn crocus. Um, they're not native to here. I don't know. They're probably European, I would think. I don't know, but um, they have, yeah, they bloom at a unusual time of year. I'm afraid I don't know much. If the question, if I understand correctly, and the question is about colchicum, not camas, I don't think I can help. Or, But maybe the question was about camas. The question is, are they in the same family and treated the same way, I presume, in terms of seeding? Yeah, they're actually, they've changed the families. Camus is in the asparagus family now. And and I would guess the autumn crocus is not. If you look at a camus um, seed head as it's starting to unfurl, it has this spiral arrangement, which it looks like asparagus. And I just think that's really cool. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm not very helpful with that question. I don't think I know enough about colchicum to to be able to answer. For site prep in a baked backyard, does rototilling have any place? Yeah, I think it can. Um, yes. I, it's, I don't have as much experience with that because I'm sort of lazy. I like just like to cover things up and uh, forget about it for a while, but definitely. And as, um, as we, as I mentioned briefly, one thing people can do is repeatedly tilling. I mean, it's not probably great for soil structure. We're told to not till as much for you know other reasons, but from the perspective of um, stirring up seeds, that are in the soil already, getting them to grow, and then you know stirring them up again. That is definitely a technique people use. So there's disadvantages and advantages to all these. I mean, covering a pot of ground with plastic for a year is not the most delightful thing either. So <laughs> you've got to have to take your pick of how am I going to get rid of this lawn, um, unless you want to just stop mowing the lawn and you know, put a few things in it. But yeah, I think I think there's some options with tillage. Do you, is that helpful or, yeah, okay. Do a small patch first. Good question, you have touched on a lot of native flowering plants, wildflowers. Um, are there other non-flowering native plants that you would recommend to really increase our biodiversity and mm -hmm. restore those habitats? Well, all plants flower. We just don't always think the flowers look like much like grasses. So I haven't talked about grasses much, but there are some nice native grasses that are a little hard to find. Um, yeah, I mean, <clears throat> All the plants have value, really. Um, I mean, some seem to attract more wildlife and insects than others. Um, so I would never want to say like this, you know, this plant is more important than that one, but um, they really all provide a benefit. I mean, shrubby habitat is wonderful. And we do have a lot of that already, but 
thinking about those shrub areas, I mean, the shrubs flower and actually are wonderful pollinator plants, spirea and snowberry, which we don't really think of as a flowering shrub. We think of the berries, but it has small little pink flowers that are very attractive to pollinators. So, um, I, yeah, I, I guess um, nothing big comes to mind that's like, oh, I really should have mentioned that. Uh, I also like to focus on the more showy things because people like flowers and often we're trying to, in going native, we're trying to replace maybe some, you know, ornamental cultivated flowers with something that's maybe a little more, you know, in sync with the environment here. So often looking for things that also look, you know, at least a bit like the things that we're used to seeing. Yeah.